Hey everyone, Steve from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time around I want to talk about the AF settings on the Nikon mirrorless cameras. In this video, we'll discuss focus modes, AF area modes, and even a bunch of custom settings that'll help you get the most from your Z-series camera. Of course, I'll also talk about what to use and when, plus give you lots of setup advice. However, before we jump into the meat of this video, I want to mention that the tips here are intended to just kind of get you started. If you want more in-depth info, and honestly, you'll get a lot more out of the camera if you do, check out my new mirrorless edition of the Nikon Autofocus book. In fact, what you're about to learn here is less than 5% of the advice you'll find in that book. Also, I primarily use back button AF for all my subjects, action or still. However, these settings work the same regardless of whether you use shutter release AF or back button AF. So let's go ahead and jump in. Single or continuous AF. The first decision is if you want to use continuous or single AF. If you're using back button AF like I do, the choice is easy. You set your camera on continuous and just leave it. However, if you prefer focusing using your shutter release, you'll have to pick a mode depending on what you're shooting. Fortunately, this is really easy. Single AF allows you to lock in focus and it will hold focus at that point, at that distance, as long as you keep the shutter button halfway pressed. This is ideal for when you want to focus and recompose with a static subject. However, if the subject is moving, the AF won't follow that subject. That's where continuous AF comes in. For moving subjects, continuous AF will adjust the focus under the AF area and try to keep it sharp all the time. This works great when your AF square is on your subject. However, it's impossible to focus and recompose reliably since as soon as there's something new under your AF sensor, it'll refocus on that point. Bottom line, for static subjects, stick with single AF. For moving subjects or when using back button AF, choose continuous AF. Oh, and as a side note, that's why I typically use back button AF. I can leave the camera in continuous AF mode all the time, and if I need to lock in a set focus distance, I simply focus at that distance and then let go of the AF on button. As long as I don't refocus the lens, the camera will keep focus set to that specific distance, just like we have with AFS. For more info on back button AF, see my autofocus book or my back button AF video. Now, there are a few additional side notes here as well. First, not every AF area mode works in both AFS and AFC. For example, pinpoint AF only works in AFS mode and dynamic only in AFC mode. Second, if you have a Z50 and possibly other mirrorless cameras down the road will be included in this, you'll notice an option for something called AFA. This option lets the camera decide if it should use AFS or AFC for a given subject. In my experience, it's better just to pick the proper mode yourself from the get-go because sometimes AFA can get it wrong. We'll talk about how to change to different focus modes as well as changing to different AF area modes in just a few moments since they often go together. For now, let's talk about the various AF area modes at our disposal and what they do. AF area modes. Next we have the AF area modes. On our Z cameras, this includes single point, the wide areas, both the large and the small, dynamic, auto, and pinpoint. So let's take a quick look at each one. Single point. This is the most common AF area, and it's exactly what it sounds like, just a single AF point. This works well for the majority of subject and is, by far, my most frequently used AF area. Whatever is under the AF point is what the camera is going to focus on, and the small size offers you a high level of precision with this. I use this for any static work as well as slower moving wildlife and even some action. Dynamic mode. This is like single point AF, but with a little assistance. If things start moving a bit faster, or if I'm on an unstable platform like a pontoon boat or a kayak, I'll switch to dynamic. A good way to tell when it's time to switch to dynamic from single point is when you start having a tough time keeping the single AF point consistently on target. In fact, a good way to think of dynamic AF is like assisted single point AF. With dynamic, you use the AF sensor in the middle of the AF area as your primary point, just like if you were shooting single point AF. However, there are helper points all around it, and the square formed by the little dots shows you the edges of that area. The way it works is you start with a primary point and focus on your target. If you happen to fall off that target and that target is still within the AF area, one of the helper points will take over until you get back on target again. 
However, if that helper point loses a lock, your primary AF point will focus on whatever is currently under it, sometimes the wrong part of the subject, sometimes the background or the foreground. So dynamic works best when you can mostly keep a single AF point on the subject, but you do need a little bit of help from time to time. Wide AF areas. When the action starts to heat up a little bit more, I like to switch to one of the wide AF areas, especially the wide small area. In fact, I use the wide small area for most of my action work with the Z cameras. The wide areas work a little like group AF in our DSLRs. The single square is made up of multiple AF points and the system tries to prioritize whatever is closest to the camera. It doesn't work quite as well as group AF for close focus priority, at least not at the moment, but it definitely does get the job done. The trick with these modes is that they don't offer the precision of single point or dynamic. Well, they do tend to focus on whatever is closest to the camera. If that doesn't qualify as a good AF target, they may focus on something else under the AF area box. This usually isn't an issue if the box covers enough of the subject, but for smaller subjects, it can actually become a problem. In my experience, if the subject is actually smaller than the AF area, you do run the risk of the camera jumping to the background, especially if it's a nice contrasty background. In those cases, dynamic often works better since the smaller primary AF point isn't larger than the subject. Still, both of the wide modes work fairly well and are definitely my first choice for tracking subjects moving at fast like bird in flight type speeds. Auto Area AF Next we have the Auto AF Area and that is sort of like a 3-in-1 that includes Auto AF Area, Face and Eye Detection, and Tracking Mode. Let's take them all one at a time. First, the auto AF area. In this mode, the camera calls the shots and will attempt to determine what your subject is and focus on that. It has a tendency to gravitate towards human faces even if you have face detection turned off. For non-human subjects, it's a bit more hit and miss. Usually, but not always, prioritizing what's closest in the frame. It does a good job, but it sometimes can jump to the wrong area of the photo and there's very little you can do to get it back where you want it when that happens. Still, I think it actually works better than auto AF in our like Nikon DSLR, so that's a plus. I tend to use it for really fast tracking scenarios where I just can't seem to keep one of the normal AF areas on the subject. Small, fast things like you know little birds, stuff like that. This works especially well when the subject is against a clean background and there aren't a lot of other distractions in the area. Next, we have face detection, and on some of the Z series cameras, eye detection modes as well. The first step though is to enable these. So press the menu button and head to the custom settings menu and we'll take a look. So we wanna to go to the custom setting menu and we're looking for autofocus in this case. Give that a click. And what you're looking for is the auto area AF face slash eye detection option. And we're just gonna go ahead and give that a click. And you'll see your choices in here. We have face and eye detection. We can turn that on. We have face detection that we can just use that without the eye detection. On supported cameras, at this time it's just the Z6 and the Z7, you'll have animal detection. And as of this video, it's just really for pets. I've tried it with wildlife and the results aren't so hot. And then, of course, you can just turn the entire thing off if you don't want to have the camera trying to find eyes when you're in the auto AF area mode. So those are our choices. Let's talk about each one of them. First face detection, and remember this only works if you're in the auto AF area mode. When the system detects a face, it will put a box around that face. If it sees more than one face, it'll put a little arrow on the box as well. To switch to another face, just press the multi-selector in the direction of the arrow that's pointing to the face you want. Note that this works really well as long as the face is more or less towards the camera. It generally won't detect faces in profile or turned away from the camera. It will also miss faces if they are just a little too far away. In the event the camera doesn't see a face, it'll simply use auto AF. Eye detection works the same way, only instead of a box around the entire face, it will put a box around the eye. If the system sees multiple eyes, it will put a little arrow or arrows on the side of the box and you can use the multi-selector to choose another eye. This works well for closer range subjects, but as you move farther out, it will switch to face detection. If it doesn't detect an eye or a face, it will again use standard issue auto area AF. Some cameras also feature animal eye detection. In my experience, this works better for like cats and dogs than wildlife subjects. And in fact, I would not recommend it for wildlife at this time. Most of the time, it won't see the eye of a non-canine or non-feline, and it leaves you at the mercy of the somewhat random selection of the auto AF area. As for usage, it works just like IAF for people that we talked about a moment ago. 
The final component of the Auto AF area is tracking mode. In tracking mode, you place a box around the subject and the camera will attempt to stick with that subject as you focus. Note that I recommend using this mode in AFC and not AFS mode, since most of the time if you're tracking something, you don't want the camera to lock in a set focus distance, but you rather you want the camera to change the distance as the subject moves, right? To use it, simply press the OK button while in the Auto AF area and you'll see a little white box pop up. Place the box over your target and initiate autofocus. In AFC mode, as long as you focus, the box will continue to track the subject around the viewfinder. When you stop focusing, the AF box will return to white. Finally, to get out of tracking mode, just press the zoom out button and it'll shut it off and you'll be back to the regular auto area AF. Also note that some of the Z cameras, the Z6 and Z7 as of this video, allow you to assign a different button for subject tracking. Let's take a quick look. Okay, so I have the Z7 here. I'm going to go ahead and hit the menu button. And in this case, we want to go down to the custom setting menu controls. Give that a click. Custom control assignment and give that a click. And we have all of our little buttons here. And in this case, I actually assign this to the lens function button. But for our demonstration, because not everybody has lens function buttons on their lenses, we're just going to assign it to the FN1 button. So right now that has spot meter. I'm going to give this a click. And I'm just going to scroll down until I find subject tracking. It's right there. Just give that a click. And now FN1 has subject tracking. So now when I'm in the auto AF area mode, all I have to do is tap that FN1 button and it will instantly go into tracking mode. It's very, very handy. And when I want to get out of tracking mode, I just tap the assign button again and I'm instantly out of it. I don't have to go down to the zoom out button. So this is way more convenient and much more intuitive to use. But I do want to give you a side note. If you happen to use lenses that have lens function buttons on them, I really do prefer having my tracking mode on the lens function button. It's very handy. It's literally by your finger. So it's like, oh, I'm in auto mode. I need to start tracking. Just give it a tap. And as a side note, it's not just native Z lenses that support this. If you happen to have an adapted lens that has function buttons, something like, say, a 500PF, this will work with those function buttons as well. So pretty darn cool. And by the way, though, if you are using an adapted lens with function buttons, a lot of times you have to put it into the AE-L mode in order to make that work. And that's a little switch on the side of the lens. But anyhow, I just want to point that out because I think on the lens is probably the best place for it. But, but anyhow, that's how you put subject tracking on a programmable button. And by the way, it's just the FN1, FN2, and lens function buttons that support it at this time. So I want you to use tracking mode. Well, I find it works best when the subject is a distinctly different color from the background and that subject is moving at like slow to moderate speeds. My luck with it for fast moving wildlife subjects hasn't been that great. So I stick with one of the previously mentioned AF areas when the action really heats up. Still, it can work well for a variety of action scenarios. Just don't stick with it if you find it's not sticking to your subject very well. Pinpoint AF. This mode uses an AF point that's somewhere between a third and a quarter of the size of your normal single AF point, and it allows for ultra-precise focusing on very specific parts of the image. It's also the only AF mode that we know for sure always uses contrast detect AF for focus, so it's also potentially able to deliver the most accurate focus. However, keep in mind that it only works in AFS mode. I tend to use pinpoint when I need like super precise focus for macro shots or when I need a very precise focus location for a landscape shot, maybe if I'm using hyperfocal distance. Most of the time, however, I'm perfectly happy with normal single point AF. So that's about it for the AF area modes. Keep in mind that the explanations that we just talked about were just to get you started. That AF book I mentioned earlier goes into far greater detail for getting the most out of each AF area. We talk about how they work, their pros, their cons, their strengths, their weaknesses, and have lots of examples for what mode works best for what scenario. Still, hopefully what we talked about is enough to get you started. Swapping focus modes and AF area modes. Next, I wanna talk about a couple of ways to swap our focus modes and our AF area modes. So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is just press the I button, and that'll bring up the I menu. And you can see we have focus mode and AF area mode here. These are in the default location. Obviously, you can move these around in your camera if you want to, but these are the default location. Let's start with focus mode and talk about how to use that. Just give the OK button a click, or you can tap AFC right there where you see that with your finger. By the way, make sure that you look for the words focus mode, though, because that could say AFC, AFS, manual, whatever in there. So you don't want to necessarily look for the 
AFC that you see highlighted on the screen here, but instead look for the focus mode option that you see at the top. So I'm going to go ahead and give that a click. And you can see we can switch from AFC to manual to AFS. It's all right there. Now there is another cool trick here. If you just rotate the rear command dial, you can switch them a little bit quicker. As long as that's highlighted, I can just highlight the one that I want on top like that and go from there. So right there, it's AFC. I hit OK or I hit a half press on my shutter release to re-engage the camera's photo mode and it'll switch to that mode. So that's pretty easy. Next we have the AF area mode and it works the exact same way. I can hit the OK button here and I can switch to whichever one I want or I can just make sure it's highlighted and again just rotate that rear command dial and I can switch this way so that's a little bit faster way just highlight the one you want and boom you're there so pretty darn easy but again I think the main thing to remember here is when you're using the I menu is to look for focus mode or AF area mode at the top and not necessarily what's displayed in the little yellow boxes there. Assign focus modes and AF area modes to a programmable button. Next let's talk about another way to change our AF modes and that is by assigning them to one of your programmable buttons. I have mine on the movie record button so this allows me to change my focus mode and AF mode. In order to do it I just hold down my movie record button. Again I program this. I'm going to show you how to do that in a minute. I'm going to hold that down and if you notice the AFC and wide S are now yellow there. They're along the side in the screen view that you're looking at here. For some reason, the Z cameras put that on the side. Normally, that's going to be at the top. You'll see that at the top of your camera, not along the side like you see in the screen capture here. But anyway, if I rotate the main command dial, that's the one by your thumb, I can change from AFC to manual focus to AFS, and if you have a Z50, you'll have AFA in there as well, which is kind of an automatic version of AFS and AFC. I don't recommend using it though, it's not totally reliable. So I'm going to go ahead and go to AFC. Now the cool thing here, I'm still holding my movie record button down and if I go to the front command dial, the sub command dial and rotate it, if you notice I can go from wide small to wide large, that's auto. There is just like standard regular single point AF there and there's dynamic. So I can control both of those just by pressing my movie record button down, my programmed button down, and rotating the front or back command dial, the sub or main command dial there. So that's pretty cool. Let me show you how to program your movie record button for that too. So in order to do that, we're going to just tap the menu button, go down to controls, and we're going to go to custom control assignment. Now, if you're shooting a Z50 and possibly other Nikons will do this as well in the future, you may see custom controls then like shooting in parentheses. Same thing though. So let's go ahead and give that a click. And what we want to do is just go over to our movie record button right here. And we give that a click. And you're going to scroll down until you see focus mode slash AF area mode. And that is under the press and command dials options here, as you can see and just hit OK and that'll lock it in. And by the way, by default, this is going to normally be on your FN2 button. So if you've not touched these buttons at all, you can do exactly what I just showed you by holding that FN2 button and rotating the command dials. I personally don't really like it in that location. As you can see, I have AE lock hold on there, but I don't like it in that location, so instead I put it on the movie record button. I think it's a little bit more convenient. So there you go. Everything you need to know about switching AF modes and focus modes and all that good stuff. Custom settings. Finally, I want to talk about a few important AF custom settings you should know. We're not going to cover everything, but there are a few that I think are critical for you to know, and I want to mention them here. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let's go ahead and hit our menu button and go to the custom setting menu, and you're looking for autofocus. Give that a click. And we'll just start right at the top. And the first one is AFC Priority Selection. And we also have one for AFS right down here. If you have a Z6 or Z7, this one's not on the Z50, but again, future cameras may or may not have it. We'll talk about how to set that in a moment. For, for now, let's start with the AFC option. Give that a click, and I recommend setting this to release. Now on the Z6 and Z7, it is set by default to release the way it should be. On the Z50, however, it is set to focus. And I do recommend switching this to release. So let's talk about what the difference is between the release modes and the focus modes here. If you set this to release, the camera will take a photo whenever you press the shutter, even if it thinks the subject is not in focus. However, if you set this to focus, it will only allow the shutter to release if it has a confirmed AF lock. Now, at first, 
it seems like setting this to focus makes more sense, right? After all, why would you want the camera to take a photo if it wasn't sharp, right? Well, the thing is, sometimes the camera doesn't have a confirmed lock, but the subject is still sharp, and this is especially true for action scenarios. So I'd rather have a few extra photos to delete than to have the camera skipping images that it thought weren't sharp, but they actually were. Next, we have the AFS priority selection. Again, you're not going to see this on the Z50, and by default on the Z50, it is set to focus, and that's the way it is set here on my Z7 as well, and that is the default, and that is the way I recommend using it. AFS doesn't really quite work the way you expect it to if it's in release mode for some situations, so leave that one in focus. And next, we have focus tracking with lock-on. Let's talk about that. This option is a way for you to tell the camera what to do if you're tracking a subject and the AF area detects a drastic change in distance. So for example, maybe you're tracking a bird and a tree comes between the two of you. How long should the camera wait before giving up on the bird and focusing on the tree? That's what this setting allows you to tell the camera. A setting of one tells the camera to not really wait at all. A setting of five tells it to wait as long as possible. It also works the other way. If you're tracking a subject and you accidentally allow the AF area to slip off that subject, this setting will determine how long the camera waits until it tries to switch to and start focusing on another subject. So the big question is, what's the best setting? Well, it depends. This really isn't a set it and forget it option. Plus, it depends on the shooter and the situation. There's really not a right or wrong answer here, so I'm going to cover the benefits for both faster and slower settings. First, the faster settings, like one or two. This tells the camera that if it detects a significant change in distance under the AF area, to wait a minimal amount of time before trying to lock onto whatever is currently under the AF area. This setting is handy if you're switching from one target to another nearby target, since you can do so without releasing the AF button. Put the AF area on the new subject and the camera will jump to it a split second later. It's also really handy if you attempt to lock onto a subject and the AF area maybe grabs the background instead. Just stay on the intended subject with AF engaged and in a split second or so, it should latch onto the correct target. On the other hand, there are advantages to the longer setting. If you set this to like four or five, this is telling the camera to hesitate just a little bit longer before jumping to a new subject. So if you are panning along with a subject and a tree or some brush comes between you, the camera won't instantly jump to that foreground. It also means if you're tracking a subject and you accidentally allow the AF point to like fall off that subject, the camera won't immediately try to lock onto something else. As a little hint, if you're new to tracking, this can prove very handy. Now, personally, I've been using sort of a hybrid approach lately. I set it to five, but at the same time, I make it my like personal responsibility to engage and disengage AF as needed. If I try to focus and the camera hits the background, I let off of the AF immediately. I don't hold it and wait. If I need to switch subjects, I let off the AF. I position the AF area over the new subject, and then I re-engage. In this way, I sort of have the best of both worlds. If an obstacle comes between the camera and the target, the camera will wait as long as possible before jumping to something else. If I need to quickly change subjects or make a second attempt at a subject, I simply let go of the AF button for you know just a quick second and then I re-engage. The biggest trick here is learning to let go of the AF button when you need to. It's easy, like in all of the excitement, to just sort of press and press and press and not remember to let go. However, if you can really manage your AF button, this approach can actually work really well. At least it has for me. I can't say I use it like this like all the time, but I do use it like this most of the time. Again though, what works for me may not be the best match for you depending on your skill level, your shooting style, and of course what you shoot. So remember to experiment. Also, if you're not sure what to do, the default setting of three really is a nice compromise. Next, we have focus points used, and we have two choices here, either all or one half every other point. Now, this has nothing to do with AF areas or anything like that. Sometimes people get confused about that. Basically, this is the number of focus points that you can select inside the viewfinder. And in the past, I always said use all the points if you had like a DSLR. However, with mirrorless and you know hundreds of AF points, there's oftentimes I find myself switching this to one half every other point when I'm doing something where composition isn't like super critical. Like if I'm doing wildlife, I don't have to have absolute perfect composition. I can always clean that up a little bit later, but I do need those AF points to move around the viewfinder very rapidly for me. I want to be able to select different AF points as quickly as possible. So a lot of times I'll go to every other point and it works really well. However, when I'm doing things that 
I have a little more time, like macros or landscapes. I do prefer the all options. So this is not a set it and forget it option, at least for me. So we'll leave it on all points for right now. Next, we have store points by orientation. And this is one of my favorite features. And as you can see, I do have it turned on. It's a yes or a no. Yes means on, no is off. And let's talk about this for a second. What this store points by orientation option does is to remember where your AF area was the last time the camera was in a vertical orientation and the last time it was in a horizontal orientation and then go back to those positions when you rotate the camera. So for example, maybe you're photographing some birds in flight, but you're also photographing some static birds as well. For the flight shots, you want the camera horizontal and we'll say you want the AF point just dead center for this example. However, there's also a pretty good looking heron nearby and you wanna shoot some vertical shots of him, but you want to use an AF point that's like more towards his head when the camera is vertical. Rather than moving AF points each time, you can use this feature to have the camera do it for you. So when you're doing the horizontal flight shots, the AF point will jump to the center, but when you flip the camera vertical, it will move back to one of the side slash top AF sensors. Now, to change the AF point the camera uses in each orientation, just move the AF point to the new location when you're in that orientation. The next option is AF activation, and this is basically for back button autofocus. So if you don't want the shutter release to focus anymore, just select AF on only and you're all set there, and then it'll only focus with the back button. Next, we have the limit AF area mode selection option. Let's give that a click. And if you notice, we have a bunch of stuff checked here. These are all of the available AF area modes. Now, when you're using a programmed button, like we did with the movie record button, for instance, and you're scrolling through those different options, if there's stuff in there you never use, you can actually uncheck these options so they don't show up and it makes it a little bit quicker. So for example, let's say you never use the wide area or the auto AF area, you can uncheck those. And to uncheck those, just highlight them and press the right hand side of the multi selector. Once it's all set here, press the OK button or it won't remember it. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna jump into photo shooting mode and show you how this works. I'm gonna press the movie record button once again. And again, remember I do have that program to change both focus modes and AF area modes. And if you watch the AF area modes here as I rotate the front sub command dial, the front command dial there, you'll see that we have dynamic, we have wide small, and we have single point. And that's it. We only have those three different AF area modes. We don't have auto and we don't have the wide large anymore because I shut them off. Now they are available still on the I menu. You can see you can do all of those still here via the I menu. So it's not the end of the world if you turn those off and then you can't get to them. If you need them, you can always get them back through the I menu there. Or of course you can go back to the menu and re-enable them. So, but anyhow, that's how that works. Next, we have focus point wrap around, and this one's pretty simple. We have two options to wrap or to not wrap. And basically, if it's on no wrap like mine is, when my autofocus point gets to the edge of my viewfinder, it stops, it won't go to the other side. If I have wrap turned on, on the other hand, when I get to the edge of the viewfinder, if I keep going, it'll pop out on the other side as you see here. So for me, I'm gonna set that to no wrap. Focus point options, we're gonna skip that one because it's just display options. Next, we have low light AF. I do recommend turning that on. This is an AFS mode. You can't use this in AFC, but it's pretty cool. What it will do is in a low light situation, and by the way, it's just an on or off setting, but in a really low light situation, what this will do is it'll switch to contrast detect AF. It'll turn up the gain and it'll actually allow the camera to focus in about two stops darker light than you would normally be able to with just the camera's standard AF system. So very, very handy. I've used Use this for really late evening shoots and also for like nighttime stuff. Really nice to have on. So I do recommend leaving it on. There's not really any downside to leaving it on. Now I'm not worried about these other two options here. I do cover those in the book if you want more information, but there is one more option here. Let's go down to apply settings to live view. Now this is basically an on or off setting. And what this does is if this is turned on, it's going to show you in your viewfinder, it's gonna show you what the exposure is gonna look like, what the picture profile you're using is gonna look like, and it's gonna show you what the white balance is gonna look like all before you take the image, which is you know pretty cool. However, it does exact a toll on processing power when it does this. Now for normal situations, it's not a big deal. However, if you're doing some action, a lot of times it's nice to shut this off because I've discovered 
that if I'm doing action work, especially fast, heavy action stuff where the camera's really struggling to keep up, if you shut this off, it seems like the camera gets a better initial AF locks and it holds the target a little bit better. And it's not a night or day difference, but it is a noticeable difference. I can tell the difference when I have this on versus when I have it off. So I definitely recommend if you're doing really fast, heavy action, turn this off. But I'll tell you what, most of the time though, for what I do, I leave this on. Most of the time for what I do with this particular camera anyway. So there you go, a crash course on the Nikon mirrorless AF system. However, please keep in mind that this is less than 5% of the info found in that book I mentioned. The truth is, the Z-Series AF system has a ton of little nuances, and understanding those little differences between settings and modes is the best way to get the most performance out of that camera. This new book will walk you through everything in an easy-to-understand, step-by-step language. Plus, it costs less than like a lunch date at McDonald's. Check it out. Hey, it's free to look, right? As always, make sure you stop by my site and sign up for my free email newsletter so you never miss a blog post, a video, a workshop opportunity, a new product, or a new tip. Oh, and I never sell your info. It's only used for sending you those updates. Finally, I'd love it if you hit that like button down there. Maybe go over and hit that subscribe button while you're at it. And of course, don't forget to click the little bell to get notified when I launch a new video. Thank you so much for watching and have a great day.